Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you thank you many blessings of life, Lord. And let me just say what a beautiful day you've blessed us with, with the sunshine. It's amazing what the sunshine will do, Lord. It will just lift, lift you up, Lord. Lord, there's been several names been mentioned here today with the, with the virus and one some has went through the surgery. We just ask you to be with each and every one of them, with their families, with their caregivers, Lord. And let me say a special prayer for our doctors and nurses that are on, on the front lines, Lord. We just ask you to be with, with their safety. And let me thank you for the praise item we just heard from Miss Julia, Lord. We just thank you for that. It just uh, lifts us all up. And let me ask you to be with the first responders. Let me ask you to be with the ones that was injured last night over in Norman Park, Lord. We just be with each and every one of them and their families. We ask you to be with our service, open our hearts, receive the message. In Christ's name we pray. Father, we thank you for this day to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to worship freely. Lord, it's no surprise to you what's going on in our nation. Father, we have taken you out of our government. We have taken you out of our schools. We have taken you out of our personal lives. We have shed innocent blood. We have made a mockery of your word and your ways. Lord, you're still on the throne and you're still in control. And you tell us you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, I thank you for that. Lord, you know what's coming down the pipe this week for us with this election. And you tell us in your word to pray for those in authority over us. And Lord, I pray for our elected officials, for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and for our Senate, for our Republicans, and for our Democrats, and all those that have authority over us that make the laws. And I pray for we the people as a nation, Lord. Will you tell us in your word if we will confess our sins and turn our face to you and humble ourselves before you, then will you hear us and heal our land. For you're our God that's still in the healing business. And I pray for this country and I pray for these leaders. And in many things, Lord, not knowing how to pray as I ought for them, that the, the Holy Spirit would interpret. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Take your hymn, we'll turn to page 154. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. As the world looks upon me as I struggle along and they say shoes on my feet gave me your love Lord and a fine family thank you Lord for your blessings on me I know I'm not wealthy and these clothes are not new
I was about 30 years old, my wisdom teeth started bothering me. <laughs> it's kind of humorous. And uh, Dr. Dennis told me I need them things taken out. Go do it. So I made an appointment, went down there, and they, they were going to take them all four. And I said, no, we're going to do two at a time. Okay. And so they took the two out, and I come out of there about as near dead as I ever been, and I went home. And I got over that, and they called me and said, when are we going to get the other two? I still got them. <laughs> so, Beck, Beck, you got one person who knows what, what you're going through, huh? <laughs> if you'll turn in your pew Bibles to page uh, 1412, or in your Bible to mark the 11th chapter, beginning with the first verse. We're going to read through verse 10. Mark the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 10. Page 1412 in the Pew Bible, if you're using that Pew Bible that's in front of you. Scripture says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethlehem, Bethphage, and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye, ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Say ye to the Lord, say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him thither. And when and they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without the place where two ways meet, and they loosed him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto him, unto them, even as Jesus had commanded, that they let him go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat on him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches of the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is not Easter and this is not Palm Sunday. But this is a time when I felt the need to talk about the fact that the Lord himself has a need and has needs. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, his parents had to borrow a shepherd's cave because there was no room for them in the inn. Whenever Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and he rode in triumph into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, he rode on a borrowed donkey. When he was taken off the cross and laid in a tomb, that tomb was a borrowed tomb from Joseph of Arimathea. I want you to listen to the words of a little poem that I came across. 
they borrowed a bed to lay his head when Christ the Lord came down. They borrowed the ass in the mountain pass for him to ride to town. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. God has needs. And Jesus, as God on earth, definitely had needs. You see, the Christian faith is unique in its insistence that there are things which the Lord does need. Most of the time, you and I think of the Almighty as being something or somebody who can do anything. But there are some things that God can't do, or maybe I should say won't do, and that is he can't make a valley without two mountains. You ever thought about that? Jesus needed at this point to borrow an ass in order to go to do his job. One of the greatest preachers that the world has ever known and one of the most brilliant men of the 18th century was John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist Church. John Wesley could read eight languages, and he wrote some 440 books and pamphlets. He had an intellectual, intellectual curiosity that was beyond any of his peers. But not everyone was impressed by the fact that John Wesley was so educated and so smart and so brilliant. One woman wrote to him and said in her letter, Mr. Wesley, I have been instructed by the Lord to tell you that he has no need of your learning. To which Wesley replied, Madam, while I have no direct word from the Lord on this matter, I feel constrained to tell you that the Lord has no need of your ignorance either. I think about that, but I do know one thing that the Lord does need, that there are things that the Lord does need. On Palm Sunday, he needed a donkey. Now, have you ever thought about that donkey have you ever wondered why jesus needed a donkey that's what he chose to rode into ride into jerusalem with he was fully capable of walking he obviously didn't need that to go in there he needed an animal to make a messianic statement because he was the messiah that we have been looking for and we looked for for a long time. Many looked for a, a conquering hero and they expected him to come riding in on a white charger and fully armored and ready to go to battle with the Roman Empire. That's what they were looking for. But he needed that animal to make a messianic statement about who he was. Nowhere does he come out and say that he is the Messiah <clears throat> in the book of Mark. But here he makes that statement that he is the Messiah because so many people had so many idea, different ideas about what the Messiah was all about. Many look for a conquering hero, as I said just a moment ago. Or in the words of George MacDonald's poem, they, are all, they were all looking for a king to slay their uh, foes and raise them high. Thou camest a little baby thing that makes a woman cry. You think about what that poem says. In Mark, Jesus never comes out and says, I am the Messiah. But he does Messiah things. He does Messiah things like riding on a donkey into town. He does Messiah things like <clears throat> healing the sick and changing the water into wine, 
like healing those who are maimed, who are lame, who are deaf, and who cannot see. He heals those things, and he shows that he indeed is the Messiah. Matthew, in his gospel, even gives the Old Testament reference for where that is. Listen to Zechariah in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So when Jesus got the donkey, he was fulfilling the scripture that had been written about him. Mark lets us know that the colt needed was needed by the Lord for a sacred purpose. On the ass, the words of John ring true. The one who has seen me has seen the Father. And that's what he was trying to show on that day. He had a need, and that need was for a donkey. Now, I want you to listen to me as I say, say one more thing about that. A preacher once said, the Lord needs us, everyone, but not much. I thought about what that preacher said, and I thought how true it is. The Lord needs every one of us, but not much. Have you ever stopped to think? That there are some things that God is never going to get done in this world unless he gets them done through you? Have you ever stopped to think about that? I, I came to that conclusion, or, or to a conclusion about that, when I think about my children. All of you here know that my children are both dead, or all three dead. I keep forgetting the little baby at the very beginning. They're all three dead. Why in the world did God put them into this world and then let them have to leave in that way? I had a good conclusion drawn the other day about that. Had those two young'uns not come into this world, there would not be a great grand young'un that consumes a lot of my thoughts over in Statesboro. You understand what I'm saying? There would not be a young lady in Jacksonville, Florida, mending bones in people's backs and in people's knees and in people's uh, elbows and shoulders. And neck. There would not be a little girl, I still say little girl because she's little, a little girl in Thomasville, Georgia, who would be helping people get their just legal deeds done. Had there not been that, had we not had those children, then all of that would not have come to pass. You see what I'm trying to say to you? When we, that there are some things that God is never going to get done in this world unless he does them through you. He's not going to do that. You may be only a small instrument in a big parade, to use another metaphor, but as a high school band instructor tells his band members, if you have a part to play and you don't play it, you'll be missed. If you have a part to play in your church life and you don't play it, you'll be missed. God needs you where you are here. But then at the same time, we have to realize that none of us is indispensable. God needs you because he put you here. He's the one that caused you to be born. He made you, you. 
for a specific task. And no one of us is indispensable, but each of us is, is irreplaceable. We have that too to say, if you are gone, you're gone. And when you go, God breaks the mold. Do you know that there is nobody in the world who has fingerprints like mine? Nobody. That means there has been nobody ever in the world with my fingerprints. There has been nobody in the world who will live after me that will have my fingerprints. I want you to think about that in putting your life in perspective here in Crossland, Georgia. We're a small community. Nobody's ever going to miss us. What if we don't have church? What if we don't have this or that or the other? If we don't, the world will not be the same. You might be replaced, but there's, you will never be, there will never be another one who can do what you do when God calls you to do it. I read a little story about a Jewish man, a Jewish rabbi. <clears throat> and that he tells a story of, of this Jewish rabbi meeting God in ju on Judgment Day. And he said, the Lord God will not say to me, Sustia, why were you not Moses? But God will say to me, Sustia, why were you not Sustia? You see what I'm saying? God doesn't want you to be George Washington or George Washington Carver. God does not want you to be Abraham Lincoln or a Sawyer. God wants you to be you because of who you are. If God can't work with us, he'll work around us. We all know that. If we decide and say, to say to God, no, I'll not do what you want me to do. I won't live a life like you want me to live. He'll work around you. And sometimes the greatest obstacle God faces in getting his will done on this earth is us. We put ourselves ahead of what God wants done and our will ahead of what God wants done. The Lord has need of faithful disciples who will do his will to affect his will on this earth. And nobody can do it like you can. That's the reason God put you here. A purpose. He had something that he wanted you to do. I wish, I wish we could, I could bottle all of that as medicine and pour it into people's heads. Do you know what that would do to, uh, to the population of the United States who seek medication to help with, uh, memory problems, and with social getting along together problems, do you think and you think of what all of that would be? When you just accept the fact that God made you and you live you, you be you and you be what God, and you do what God wants you to do while you're here on this earth. What kind of response would we, would we have, would we have given whenever uh, we saw this take place in that day. There was a man who owned that colt. <clears throat> what if he had said, what do I have, what do I care? I have need of that donkey myself. And he would not have let Jesus have that donkey. What would Jesus have done? He would have worked it out. You can believe that. 
but he couldn't have worked it out as well as he could by using that man's donkey to show that he was the Messiah riding on a foal into town on a donkey that had never been ridden before. I wish you'd think about that for just a moment. Maybe we wouldn't be that way, that blunt about it, but we'd say the same thing. God needs our time. And we say to ourselves, sorry, but my time is limited. And besides, it's mine. I can do with my time what I want to do. And God says to you, every day that you live, your time would be over if you didn't have this air to breathe. Your time would be through if you, didn't have, if you didn't have this food to eat. Your time would be through if you did not have the care that I give to you day by day. He wants our time. What do I mean by that? He wants us to be present in his church. He wants us to carry, be present in his world. He wants us to do the things he's put us here to to do. God needs our time. God needs our strength as well. And you say sometimes, sorry, I can't take on another thing. I've got troubles of my own. Boy, do we hear that whenever it's, it's nominating committee time in a church. I'm so full, my schedule's so full, I can't take on anything else. So if you need to serve on a, on a, uh, on a social, on a nominating committee sometimes and see that i see some who've said who've done that shake their head this way yes that's right i've got that i've got troubles of my own well i'm gonna tell you something yes god can take a sunday school class and find another teacher he can go around you but if he put you there why can't you accept that kind of thing God needs our money, too. God has all the riches in the world, the psalmist tells us. He has all the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. You know all of the, you know, you remember that, what, what he says there. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our time. He needs us to be able to give him the priority that he needs. He wants you and me to give ourselves to him in what ways we give ourselves <coughs> to him for salvation it can only come from Christ he needs us for his for his work in this kingdom but first we have to come to him as Christ as our savior he wants us to be his hands his eyes his mouth he wants us to be him, his representative on this earth. I want to ask you, if you will, to think about what if God, Jesus, had come to your house and had taken your possession, what would you have said to him? Would you have been like this man who, who, ha who, who uh, had the colt? Would you say, take him, use him? Or would you say, wait a minute, he hasn't been broken and my insurance won't pay for it, you ain't getting it. Would that be the way we would respond? Or would we respond with our faith to the Lord Jesus? Would you bow your heads with me, please? <clears throat> Father, you have been so good to us over the years and you have made us to be your children. You have given us every aspect that we have. Our mental capacity, our social, uh, uh, our social traits. You've given to us the possessions that we have and we've earned. You've been so kind to us. We know that you love us. That love was capped off when Jesus gave his life for us. I pray that you'd help us to see that we must give to him. You put us here, Lord, on this earth 
You put us here in our own particular place. You chose the right time for us to be born. You gave to us the right parents that could rear us. You gave us the right friends and the right mates so that we could carry on the human race on this earth. You've given to us what we need. And our Father, I pray that you'd help us to see that we need to give back to you ourselves, our souls, our lives, so that you can make them to be what you'd have them to be. And now, our Father, as we leave this place, we pray that we may leave in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ.